Um, oh, and while I was I was listening so intently to the description of our technology, I lost track of the young puffin. <laughs> I should have been paying attention to my bird. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Oh, it is exciting right now because Chandra just started tossing some of those fish out into the water. And there you can see those kitty wakes. Look, they just land at the surface and grab something and then fly away with it. As opposed to those other birds that have now started diving down below. Now it's really hard to see from up here. So I will have video to show you of what it looks like when those birds are underwater. Because up here, it's just a little too bright for us to see. But from downstairs, we can see those birds really well. So I have video that's collected from downstairs in our underwater viewing area. And we'll be able to see what it looks like when those birds are diving down underwater. Oh, now we also have some of the birds haven't quite gobbled up all the fish yet. So those of you who were curious about what they eat, look, she has tossed some around out on the rocks and it's taken a little while. And oh, there's one of our young pufflings. That one right in the center with the dark face is one of the young puffins and maybe a second one right next to it, actually. I wish I knew their names, but uh, I can't keep track. Um, we had last year, we raised one called Starburst one called Gumdrop, and oh, there was another candy one, and I forget uh, what its name was, but I can't remember which one is which. <laughs> so all of these birds have names, and the way that I could tell that those puffins are the young ones, they're one-year-olds, is by that face, that dark face. You can see, oh, just tried to steal a little fish from under another bird. <laughs> there we go. It got one. That dark face compared to the white faces of the adult horn puffins in the back now, uh, that's my clue. So they wouldn't be considered babies. Those are um, those young ones with the dark faces were hatched last year, but uh, we do from time to time raise little baby puffins and they are called, I'll type it into the chat. Pufflings. Uh, true story. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, uh, do they eat octopus too? I wouldn't think so. Um, interesting question. And uh, as the bird feeding is winding down there, I'll go ahead and switch back to my face. Uh, because octopuses hide very well. And as we'll see, most of these birds, the way that they swim underwater is good for animals that are out and about like fish, uh, like little skinny fish that tend to be swimming out in the open water or squid, same thing, swimming out in the open water where octopuses are gonna be hiding down in the rocks. So we'll learn a little bit more about how and why these birds swim down there underwater and talk about some of the features of their body that allow them to do that. And then that might help us understand why they probably wouldn't, my guess is they would never find an octopus. Um, and of course, here in Alaska, octopuses grow to be almost as big as I am. So these little tiny birds would definitely not wanna mess with one of those uh, octopuses if they found it out and about. All right, so uh, we're gonna take a look at <clears throat> some video of these birds diving, and then we'll, we'll back up a bit after my remote control response. There we go. Try that again. We'll back up and learn a little bit more about their biology. Sorry for the brief delay here. My video player is taking a moment for itself. There we go. All right. So here we're going to see a video of two birds, two types of birds diving. The first one is called a pigeon guillemot. And it's going to come out from behind the kelp and then head down to the bottom. Here it goes. Right behind it is one of those tufted puffins that we saw. And now you can see there are fish in there, but those fish are much bigger than the ones that these birds would eat. But you can see the way that bird is swimming. It looks around down on the bottom, but it's very good at just swimming through the middle of the water and doesn't really spend a lot of time hanging out uh, down in the little cracks and crevices where an octopus might hide. They're much better at just catching things straight <laughs> out of the water. 
uh, the octopus is going to have to be a longer conversation. Yes, uh, I would agree. Octopuses are worth many a long conversation. They happen to be my favorite animal out there in the ocean. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about how these diving birds in particular are able to do that. That bird was just swimming underwater, right? So first of all, we are located in Alaska at about 60 degrees north latitude. So on a map here, those of you who are in Kelowna, British Columbia, right? You're down here. We are located around the middle of Hudson Bay. And uh, I don't have Europe on my map, unfortunately. So I can't compare that to the latitude of Italy, sorry. Uh, but in Italy, you're down on the Mediterranean. We are definitely not uh, that warm, right? So we are right on the edge of the North Pacific Ocean and the Arctic Circle would be right about here. And this is a photo of our town. The ocean is right here and this is the Alaska Sea Life Center. I could throw a snowball into the water from where I'm standing uh, if I were outside. So we're right next to this ocean and the temperature of that ocean is about about 45 degrees Fahrenheit or roughly five, six degrees Celsius. So it's extremely cold and that's year round. So this picture was taken in the summertime when all the snow has kind of melted away from the mountains, except on the backside of these mountains on the north faces, you can't see it from here, but there are glaciers where the snow doesn't ever melt completely. And then it just builds up as these huge, slow moving rivers of ice called glaciers. But even in the summertime, though it looks nice and sunny and warm, uh, the temperature in the town might still only be about 50 degrees Fahrenheit or roughly 10 degrees Celsius uh, because the ocean is right here and it keeps us very cool in the summertime. It also keeps us somewhat warm-ish in the winter. So we kind of hang around the freezing point. So right now there are piles of snow and ice all over town. They're finally melting. Finally, but uh, I still have a pile of snow in my yard as tall as I am. It is getting smaller. I, I have hope <laughs> that it will go away eventually. <laughs> but some of you, you were located, I believe, in Minnesota. Um, I know that's where Tammy is based and maybe Allison as well. Minnesota gets way colder than we do because the ocean is right there and we can't get that cold, that, that ocean keeps our temperature kind of in the middle of like on the cool side, but we never get very hot. We never get very cold right here in our town. If you get away from the ocean, um, then it's a little bit more like Minnesota temperatures in the wintertime, minus 50 degrees um, Fahrenheit and Celsius, pretty close. So uh, luckily I'm not in a place where it gets quite that cold. So looking at our little seabirds. Here we have these tiny little animals. And of course, birds are warm blooded just like we are. But they live in this ocean that is freezing cold. And look at how comfortable they seem to be. They're just plump and happy out there. And now you can see a lot more bird species that we didn't notice before. We've got a rhinoceros auklet. Uh, we have, oh, our smew. He's a lovely little sea duck. We have some other duck species out here, very colorful. The king eider, beautiful. And some of our puffins are happily diving down at the moment. So these birds live out there in that freezing cold water. And we'll talk first about this, the things that help them to stay warm in that cold water. So of course, birds are covered in feathers where mammals like us have hair or fur, birds have feathers and they have a few different kinds of feathers that work together to keep them warm in that freezing cold water. So on the outside of these birds, the colorful feathers that we see are typically what we call contour feathers. Now there's this sort of flat part out at the outer edge and then at the inner edge of the contour feather, it's a little bit more fluffy and fancy looking. The flat part out there is the part that we typically see. It gives the bird its color and it helps to create almost like a waterproof shell. So if you live in a place where it snows, 
when you go out to play in the snow on the outside of your body, you might have some sort of waterproof, like a thin layer, right? But then underneath that, there's something poofy. It might be all one thing that makes you sort of shaped like a sea star, or it might be separate layers. Like you got some poofy layers and then you put on that thin thing on the outside to stay waterproof so you can roll in the snow and not just be soaking wet. That's kind of the idea with the contour feather. Now, underneath these contour feathers, birds that live in the water, especially here in the cold water, have what are called down feathers and lots of them. Now, down feathers are just little fuzzy. They don't really look like much of anything. It's almost like a dust bunny. This is a collection of down feathers from a goose nest. After the nest was long abandoned, these feathers were pulled out from the nest. And you can see they just create this kind of tangled mess. It's almost like fur, but this is like a ball of air. And that's what our poofy clothes do for us. They just trap a whole bunch of air around our body. So the down feathers trap this layer of air all around the bird's body underneath the contour feathers. So we've got this waterproof shell and then this poofy layer of air underneath. Well, when they dive down, the water squeezes down on those feathers and bubbles come out. So we're gonna watch that diving bird video again. And if you didn't notice before, I am sure you will see it this time, you will notice bubbles coming out from the birds. Those bubbles are air just coming out of their feathers as they swim down underwater. Well, that air is what keeps them warm. So if all the air goes away, then they need to put it back. They don't have a pump to pump themselves up. So they need a way to get the air back into their feathers. So we see all of this air leaving their feathers. How are they going to put it back? They're going to take a bath. And I can see a few of our birds outside are sort of bathing right now. So we'll uh, take a look here and see if we can find some birds that are fluffing themselves up, getting that air back in their feathers. One of them is, looks like it's chasing itself. All right, bath time for puffins gets a little silly. Oh, there we go, that's a good one. I hope this is not how you all take a bath, but it's really important for these birds to move all over. That one even went upside down and in the water. So as they're shaking themselves like this, Oh, that one's really hard to follow. Let's try this one over here. This one's a little bit more settled. As they're shaking their bodies like this, they are fluffing up those down feathers. That's a good example of how they get the air into their body. Now this one's gonna start to go nuts too. There we go. That is very important. They are fluffing themselves up to get that air back in their feathers. And that's what's going to keep them warm out there in that cold water. All of this only works though, if the birds have waterproof feathers, because they need to stay dry. And I'm looking around for a bird that's preening. There's a little bit of preening going on, but nothing great. So I'm gonna go back to a video here. We're gonna see a tufted puffin preening, and that means taking care of their feathers or sort of straightening them, but they are also spreading oil on their feathers. So the oil comes from right at the base of their tail. And the bird makes its own oil. So they have something called an oil gland that produces that oil. And you can see where it is, is at the base of its tail. Think for a moment, uh, and you can try it if you want. Can you touch your nose to your bottom? Hmm. <laughs> we can't do that, right? And if you look at this tufted puffin, it doesn't look like it has a long neck. It just looks like a small round bird. But in under all those poofy feathers, it does have a very long skinny neck because it has to. It has to be able to reach every part of its body with its beak. And that is going to allow that bird to spread that oil over all of its feathers. So if I go back to the beginning of the video here one more time, it gets the oil from the oil gland at the base of its tail and then it goes and spreads that oil over the other feathers. And that is gonna keep those feathers waterproof. So that's another important part of staying warm and dry out there. So now we see how these birds are just staying warm. 
Now we need to think about how they swim underwater. I'll ask, uh, I haven't looked at the chat in a while here. Um, so I'll take a, a look back at some questions, but I'm also gonna ask you a question. And while I look at your answers, I will look for any questions that folks have asked me. <clears throat> When those birds were diving, were they using their wings or their feet to swim through the water? So go ahead and answer that. And I'm going to switch my camera over. Oh. To fix my menu. And then I have an activity for you here. There we go. All right. Do we have geese? No, unfortunately, I think our habitat is not big enough um, <clears throat> for geese. We would love to have some geese, but that's just a little bit too small here. Oh, the coldest temperature in our town this year was about, um, <clears throat> we actually got a little bit extreme for us, minus five degrees Fahrenheit or Mm, I don't know where that is. Minus 20 Celsius, somewhere in there. Close. All right. It looks like almost everyone has said wings, um, but a few folks said feet. Now, let's watch another video. This time it's going to be some ducks diving, and you're going to see a little bit of both. Um, but you'll notice when the ducks first dive down, they're going very fast using their wings and then they get to the bottom and now the ducks tend to eat stuff that's right down on the bottom or in the bottom. And so once they're there, they just kick with their feet because they're not trying to go fast. They're not chasing things. They're just looking around. So they're kind of holding themselves there. And remember all that air in their feathers. They also have a big breath of air that they have pulled into their body, into their lungs, and then special spaces called air sacs in their body. So there is a lot of air in this bird, so much that when it wants to go back up, all it does is point toward the surface and then rock it. All right, so the ducks used um, their wings a little bit when they wanted to go fast, and then their feet once they were all, all the way down at the bottom. Back to that first vi video that we saw earlier, just to remind us, these two birds were using mostly their wings. Every once in a while, though, they do kick with their feet. But these birds are swimming faster than those ducks, and the puffin just kind of keeps swimming through the water. To do that, it's using its wings. So they have these wings that paddle them through the water. And that's what we're going to examine next. We're going to see the wings of these diving birds and see how they are built for diving. And to understand that, we're gonna compare the wing of a diving bird with the wing of a bird that cannot dive underwater. So I will have two wings. One is the wing of one of those common murs that we saw earlier, looked a lot like a penguin. The other one is the wing of a bird that might live in, um, the same area as all of you, actually. There could be a form of this bird, um, something you might be familiar with. So here are the two wings. As you can see right away, one is very small and the other one is very big. Now, I want to know between the small one and the big one, which one do you think would be better for paddling underwater, diving down underwater, small, or big, which one's better for diving? Let's see. I'm thinking small, small. Small, small. All right, well, I mean, for sure, it's easier to move through the water, right? This big one would be a lot harder, um, but it's a little hard to say. <laughs> yeah, split decision. It just, that's maybe not enough information. This one's small, this one's big, okay. Um, maybe small, but we're not sure yet. This time I won't show you. But one of those wings is really heavy. The other one is very light. Which one do we think would be better for diving down underwater? The heavy one or the light one? 
try that. Oh, excellent point, Jessica. Uh huh. Okay. So light. Uh, I mean, that makes sense, right? If I'm paddling a canoe, I don't really want a super heavy paddle. That's really tiring, right? So a nice light one is great. I can paddle all day with that nice light paddle. But there's something else that's really important. Oh, oh someone thinks that a heavy wing would be like a weight to help the bird get down underwater. Interesting. So maybe the heavy one, uh, but maybe the light one, still not sure. Okay, one more piece of information. And I think we'll probably be able to agree on this one. Think of it like a canoe paddle again. Uh, paddling underwater. Do I need that wing to be strong or weak? One is very strong and the other one is very weak. What do we need for paddling underwater? Mighty. <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah. I mean, just like my canoe paddle, right? If it's made of wood, then it's strong enough to paddle through the water. But if it's made of just paper, something light and floppy, it's not strong enough to paddle in the water. What's confusing is this little tiny one is also the strong one. And because it's made to be strong, it's heavier than this big one that is more than twice the size. So this small, very strong wing is quite heavy because it's built to be able to paddle underwater. And that means those birds also have to be really strong. Their muscles are very strong. If I were a bird like these, um, they couldn't be as big as I am. It's just not really possible. But if I were, the muscles on my chest would go out as far as my arm can reach. That's how thick the muscles would be on my chest to be able to flap those wings underwater and in the air. Because remember, all of these diving birds can also fly. Well, looking back at my two wings, this is the wing of the common mer, those tall black and white ones that we saw first. This is the wing of a crow. A crow is not a very big bird. It's not very heavy and it flies very well. It's very easy for that crow to fly. A common myrrh weighs about one kilogram or over two pounds and it has this little tiny wing. So we're gonna see how hard it is for some of these diving birds to fly. Let's take a look. And you are welcome to flap along with these birds if you would like. We're going to see two different birds in this video. One is down by the water. That is a diving seabird. And the other one up in the sky is not a diving bird. Now, if you're flapping along, you can feel it. But even if you're just watching, you'll notice the one down by the water seems to be flapping its wings faster, right? That was in slow motion. So now I encourage you to try to keep up with the bird. We're going to flap along with that bird down by the water. See if you can move your arms this fast. That is how these diving birds fly. <laughs> they have to flap their wings up to 400 times a minute to stay up in the air. And why is that important for our diving birds? Because <clears throat> we'll focus on those common murs again for a moment. No penguins in Alaska. Why not? Because in Alaska, on land, we have polar bears, brown bears, black bears, foxes, wolves, coyotes, wolverines, all kinds of animals that would love to eat short, fat little birds that couldn't fly away. <laughs> on their stubby little legs. So here, these birds all need to be able to fly to get up to somewhere safe where they can be away from those predators on land. And we can see here at the Alaska Sea Life Center, we have built cliffs for these birds and our kitty wakes are sitting up there already. Pretty soon, the puffins will start ending up on these cliffs as well, but you can see Right there in the center of the screen, there is a little, it's 
like a hole in the cliff with some rocks stuffed in it. And there's a number next to it. It's either a 12 or a 13. I can't read it from this distance. That is the entrance to a burrow. And the burrows are these tunnels into the cliff. And that is where our puffins like to build their nests. The common murs will not build a nest at all. They just sort of stand right on these ledges. But these are safe places where they can be up away from predators to raise their little chick. So that is why it's super important for all of these birds, including these common murs, to be able to fly in addition to diving underwater. You'll notice these common murs tend to function as a group. They're all going the same way now. They like to be together, and so they will end up on the side of the cliff in a big colony, a big group of them, just like penguins. You've probably seen video or pictures of penguins all standing around on the ice. These birds look very similar. But unlike those penguins, these common murs can also fly. But these are the deepest diving seabirds in the world that can fly. They can dive as deep as 600 feet, almost 200 meters underwater. But they can also fly, and that allows them to survive here in Alaska, up north where we have all these predators. And let's see, Ooh, how far can they fly? Well, that is a good question. A lot of these birds, um, Right now, this time of year, uh, birds like these tufted puffins are kind of obvious. So here's what they look like in the summer. But if you notice this one over here, it's not quite there yet. This one is still growing in its summertime feathers. So at this time of year, these birds would probably all still be out in the open ocean, but they would be heading back to land soon to find a place to nest. And as I mentioned, those puffins like to nest in burrows. Excuse me. So we're gonna see a brief video of a puffin next to a burrow so we can see what those burrows look like when they are open. And <clears throat> these burrows will be opened up soon for our puffins to explore and then they will build a nest, but this is only in the summer. In the winter time, they are not on these cliffs. There you can see a tufted puffin standing next to the entrance to a burrow. This happens to be a female puffin. I can only tell because I can see that little red band around her left leg. The males and females look exactly the same of most of these uh, diving birds that we're looking at today. And so in order for us to keep track, we band the girls on the left and the boys on the right. It's much easier for us to see. So this female tufted puffin is standing outside the burrow and her mate, the male, is almost certainly inside the burrow and they will stand there at the entrance and talk to each other. And here's what it sounds like when a tufted puffin talks to its mate. Oh, 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 oh. They make this sort of low groaning sound. <laughs> it's very quiet. And so it echoes inside that burrow and they can quietly talk to each other. Uh, who knows what they're saying, but maybe they're saying it's my turn to sit on the egg and keep it warm. Maybe they're saying, is the chick hungry? I have some fish to feed it. So if that's where they spend their time in the summer, where do they go in the winter? They just head out to sea. These birds don't fly long uh, migrations going south. They just go away from land. And so they don't need to fly far. When you ask how far do they fly, I don't know. It would be hard to test because they have no need to go any long distances. Um, so they're not like some of the birds out there in the sea that will uh, fly thousands of miles. It's not like that. They just don't go that far. All right, let's see what other questions we have uh, before we finish up here. How high can they fly? Ooh, I don't know. Uh, again, they only go to these cliffs and then all their food is down in the water. Um, so they don't have a need to go very high. So I wouldn't think that they would um, go up very high. Do they have friends other than their mates? Um, 
I they are near each other, but I think it's more like we like this cliff area, so we're going to be here. And um, one pair will usually mate for life. So one male and one female. Um, but they do often get together in these groups out in the open ocean, even in what are called rafts. So there will be several of them uh, together. Uh, and then on the cliffs, there are just areas on the cliff that they all like. And so they are near each other, but they don't really, I don't think they would, you consider it friends, even though they're near each other. I don't think they have like relationships uh, except for the male and female. And that's why they have all those fun, bright feathers in the summertime. When it's time for mating again, they put on all their nice feathers and they do little dances. They open their mouths like this for each other. I guess that's, good looking for a puffin. Uh, anyway, they uh, do nice things to show off for each other. And that is just them making that relationship strong again every year. Uh, so let's see. Puffins have fish with fins. Yes. Oh, that's hilarious. I love your uh, humans trying to understand the joke. <laughs> oh, we don't have any one winged birds. No. Um, all of our birds could fly uh, if they were in an open space. So some of them are small enough to do little circles here. The kittiwakes are flying around, but uh, even our little pigeon guillemots, which we haven't noticed yet, uh, except in that video, but they are sitting still, so I can show you what they look like. Um, these birds are small enough that they are able to fly around a little bit in our habitat. That one just showed off its bright red feet. That was cute. Uh, but most of them are a little too heavy. They need to fly a pretty straight line. Um, we don't have any with just one eye or one leg either. These are not rescued birds except for one of them. Uh, and I don't know why that one, it's a tufted puffin. I don't remember why um, it could not be released, but because of where these animals live, way out in the open ocean or out on these remote cliffs, it's not likely that we would ever find them and be able to rescue them. So uh, that's why most of these birds either hatched here at the Alaska Sea Life Center or at another facility like ours. Um, a few of these birds um, that we have here came in from the wild as eggs or chicks. They were collected, but only a few. And uh, most of the rest were hatched somewhere else or here uh, at this point. So we don't have a need to go out to the wild to get more birds because there are lots of places that have these species and we can find them or we can raise them here and then uh, transfer them to these other facilities that might like to have these species too. And so those one-eyed or one-legged birds or uh, one-winged birds are often rescues. Um, it's just unlikely with the species we have here because they probably wouldn't survive long enough for someone to find them and for us to rescue them if they were really uh, badly injured somehow, just because of where they live. Interesting question though. All right. Let me ask you a question. Do I find puffins as cute? They are super cute. Yes. <laughs> I do love them. Uh, I don't know that I'd say I have a favorite out here. We have looked a lot at those puffins and they're pretty different from the ducks, which I only showed a little bit of. Uh, so these are two main groups of birds, the pigeon guillemots and then the puffins. And those common murs that we saw earlier, these guys, those are all what we call alcids. But then we have a group of birds that fit into the sea duck category. So here's one. He's a Stellar's Eider. Lovely little fella. And then his mate is, I think this is her. Where'd she go? Has her back to me. She's just very dark brown. Yes, that's her. Then uh, same over here with the King Eiders. There is the female. And the male, oops, he's hiding behind a piece of driftwood. He's very colorful. So where the alcids um, tend to have males and females look exactly the same, uh, the ducks are very different because the ducks don't take turns on the nest. It's only the mom that sits on the nest. And 
she's not hiding in the middle of a cliff. She's sitting right on the ground often right out in the open. So her body needs to hide on the ground. So those female ducks that we just saw, they're all very brown and hide well down on the ground. But for the puffins and the other alcids, they're up on a cliff somewhere. The puffins are inside the cliff even. So they could be purple and green and blue and flashing lights and everything and no one would ever see them. So they can be bright and colorful and that's okay. They want to look attractive, but they don't need to hide because they're hiding inside the cliff. For the ducks, it's very different. Why are the males so colorful? Because the male's job is to be attractive and look nice for that female. And even some of those male ducks will kind of hang around while the female is on the nest. The male can be distracting and other animals that might be predators will notice this colorful male and he might fly around even and attract the attention of those predators because he can fly away. So he'll keep the attention away from the female hiding on the nest. That's not for all ducks, but it is very often that for the ducks, the female hides on the ground in the nest. The male is very brightly colored in the breeding season uh, when they uh, need to look fancy. So I have like the cutest ones. I don't know that Stellar's Eider is really good looking. The Smew is another one that I mentioned earlier. Uh, he's very cool. And he's sort of like 80s cool. When he really gets excited, he will stand up the feathers on top of his head like a big white mohawk. That stripe that you can see, they stand straight up. It's pretty amazing. So he's a little flashy. Uh, again, another type of duck. And right behind him is his mate. She's a little... She's not quite as brown as those others because she would actually nest up in a tree. And so her head needs to hide, um, but the rest of her body would not be visible from below. All right, let's see. <laughs> have I hugged one of our birds? No, I have handled a few of them. I guess you might. It's almost like a hug. Um, you grab them from around their body and kind of hold their wings so they won't uh, flap around and injure themselves. And I only pick them up if like one bird ends up down here where I'm standing, there's a place for people to walk out here and enjoy our aviary. And if a bird ends up out here, some of them can't fly strong enough to get back up on their own to get back into the water. So we'll pick them up and put them back in the water. I want to do that fast because these birds all have strong beaks and I don't want to get bitten by them. So I pick them up and set them back in the water, but I don't hold them and hug them. <laughs> I don't think they would like to be hugged either, which is probably when they would start biting you. <laughs> I would definitely not recommend hugging a puffin, uh, Declan, because those big, bright, colorful orange beaks can bite to the bone on your finger. <laughs> they are very, very strong. Uh, so yeah, hugging a puffin is not recommended. But if you ever get the chance to come visit the Alaska Sea Life Center, or there are other zoos and aquariums around that have puffins, check and see. We have something called a puffin encounter <clears throat> when it's available. You actually get to go out and do what Chandra was doing at the beginning of the program. You sit down and hand feed those birds. You don't get to hug them, but you do get to be very close with those birds. So uh, I'm not sure how old you are, if you would be old enough to be able to do the Puffin Encounter here. But if you check it out, uh, you can find out more information. And again, there are other, other facilities that might be closer to you um, that have puffins and, and also probably do some kind of encounter tour where people get to get very close to those birds. <clears throat> yeah, I don't remember. Uh, it'd be on our website how old you have to be to feed them. Okay, well, we do need to wrap up. Uh, I want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to Allison for introducing uh, everybody. And thank you to everyone for being patient while I was running a little bit late this morning. Thank you to Miss Robbie, who is uh, interpreting for our folks who are not able to hear everything that I'm saying. That is fantastic. 
Yay, Teacher Darren. It is always so fun to learn from you and see all of your wonderful setup and equipment. And we got to move around in so many ways in this virtual space. Loved it. So fun to learn from you as always. And from all of our amazing learners here today, it was so great to hear from all of you. Your questions were so amazing. All of your comments and observations. Give all of yourselves a round of applause. You did so much amazing work today and helped us all learn even more. So thank you to all of our learners as well. We want to remind you that you don't have to stop hanging out with Teacher Darren. I mean, maybe today we have to say goodbye, but you can actually hang out with his amazing team and learn about so many different topics. I just dropped the link to his member page or the Alaska Sea Life member page, and you can check out the different programs you can schedule. You can even have your camera and your microphones on for those conversations. So oh, go yes. ahead and click that and make sure to check out all of those wonderful programs. I didn't see any other questions right. come in. Nope. Neither okay. did I. Awesome. Yeah, we had some great ones along the way. Those were super fun. They were. I really enjoyed your questions today. I do. And I also enjoy the questions and the bravery of all of our friends that are trying to hug oh, yes. in. So be, uh, be <laughs> <Yeah>. careful. <laughs> Bad idea. <laughs> Protect your face. Now we know. <laughs> and we want to remind everyone that tomorrow, we're not actually going to be here tomorrow due to a scheduling conflict that came up. But no worries. We'll be back here on Friday, same time we met today. We're going to actually be learning how to use recycled materia, material to create a woven artwork. So really exciting, fun way to learn about weaving that you can do with Super a lot cool. of different products. So I just dropped the link there to go ahead and register. Teacher Darren, you're always invited as well. So please feel free to come and weave uh, with recycled materials with us on Friday as well. <laughs> oh, that sounds super fun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, great. We appreciate all of you. And we want to say thank you again to our wonderful educator here today. We also want to say special thanks to Miss Robbie, who is here with us providing mm -hmm. American Sign Language interpretation due to our partnership with the American Society for Deaf Children. We are grateful to both the society as well as Miss Robbie. We love spending time with you too. Thank you so much. Yay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. See you next time. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>